Welcome to Physician Academy. Today we have an introduction to acute kidney injury. Please share our talks with others. Encourage others to join us. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube page. This way we expand our community and as we grow we can offer you more services. So today is an acute kidney injury. It's an introduction. Acute kidney injury is also known as acute kidney disease. It used to be called acute renal failure. This is a rapid decrease in renal function that occurs over days to weeks, causing an accumulation of nitrogenous products in the blood, also called azotemia. The most common cause or commonly caused by inadequate renal perfusion due to severe trauma, illness, or surgery. Acute kidney injury falls into three categories, pre-renal or before the kidney, which is related to decreased perfusion, renal or also known as intrarenal or intrinsic kidney disease, and then third is post-renal or after the kidney as an obstructive uh, nephropathy. Pre-renal, before the kidneys or decreased perfusion, um, Commonly, it's extracellular fluid volume depletion, dehydration is a common cause, hemorrhage, diarrhea, vomiting, burns, trauma, or any other idea is that, or any other causes of acute volume depletion. Another uh, possibility is cardiovascular disease or uh, congestive heart failure. The pre-renal represents about 50 to 80% of all acute kidney injury. So if you're making a bet on the cause of this, it's generally pre-renal. Generally, there is no permanent damage and mostly reversible. That's why it's an acute injury and not a chronic injury. And it's reversible if the problem is corrected. Permanent damage, when ischemia causes ischemic damage to the tubules, becomes a chronic kidney disease. Hyperperfusion leads to decreased GFR. Decreased GFR activates the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system and enhanced reabsorption of sodium and water leading to oliguria, also known as uh, low urine output or hypouresis, and high urine osmolality and low urine sodium. This is from an activation of the renal angiotensin and aldosterone system. So those are things to look for when you're trying to diagnose this. Renal, the second way is renal or intrinsic uh, kidney disease, represents about 10 to 40 percent of cases. It involves the glomeruli, tubules, and interstitium. Most common acute tubular necrosis is the most common intrarenal injury. Cell death of tubular cells, um, they plug the uh, cell death of the tubular cells, plug the tubules, and leads to increased pressure in the glomerulus. Ischemia is another or nephrotoxins like myoglobin, or causes of this are ischemia, uh, nephrotoxins like myoglobin, lead, ethylene glycol, uh, also known as antifreeze, and aminoglycoside, or in uric acids. Glomerular disease uh, decreases the GFR and increases the permeability to protein. So think glomerular nephritis or vasculitis or vascular damage from ischemia when you see uh, higher levels of protein in the urine. What happens is the podocytes are damaged in the glomerulus and allows protein and RBCs to pass into the urine. Tubular damage from ischemia, think about impaired sodium reabsorption because this is what the tubules do which leads to elevated urine sodium. It should be noted that elevated urine sodium, think tubular damage, Metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, and azotemia. Uh, it, it should also be noted that brown granular casts indicate tubular damage. So these are all signs that you need to look for. Now the third type of acute kidney injury is the post-renal, or also after the kidney, or obstructive nephropathy. This represents only 5 to 10% of the cases. So you get obstruction of Obstructive ultrafiltrate in tubules, or more distally, leads to increased pressure in the glomerulus, causing a decrease in GFR. Obstruction in a signal, sig, single kidney, sorry about that, in a single kidney does not lead to azotemia. So if you just have one kidney blocked, 
everything will work as normal, but you're going to have other problems with that kidney. Bladder obstruction, think prostate, the most common cause of cessation of urinary output in men. So in general, symptoms of AKI. So there's weight gain, peripheral edema, symptoms related to other illnesses that cause the acute kidney injury, symptoms of uremia, that which are nausea, vomiting, anorexia, seizures, confusion, coma. They can also get other symptoms would be chest pain, worse with inspiration and when laying down, pericardial friction rub. Another symptom that you should look for is Cola colored urine, and that might be a key word that might be used on a test. On a test, so the patient comes in, complains of cola colored urine, so it looks like they they're peeing Coca Cola. Um, urine may represent glomerular nephritis. They also can have CVA tenderness. This is usually due from the stretching of the capsule of the kidney or inflammation. Things to look in for the urine. Urine output changes with time. So pre-renal, you get oliguria. Post-renal, anuric. Acute tubular injury has three phases. Prodomal phase, urine output is normal, and this is one to two liter, one to 2.5 liters per day. Oliguric phase, 50 to 400 mLs per day, so a dramatic drop. Note that, ma that many patients never enter this phase, and those that do have a worse prognosis with increased mortality and morbidity. So. Oliguric is a really oliguric phase is really a dramatic uh, problem and it should um, be corrected. Post oliguric phase is the third phase of the of this injury of the of the acute tumular injury, and this urine output ret returns to normal, but creatinine and BUN remain elevated. So the three phases: prolonged prodromal phase, oliguric phase, and post oliguric phase. So how do you diagnose AKI? AKI is suspected when urine output falls or serum creatinine and BUN rise. Look for the cause. Physici physical exam and test to evaluate the patient would be CBC with diff, complete metabolic panel, urinalysis. A progressive daily rise in serum creatinine is diagnostic for AKI. Look for acidosis. Moderate as seen with plasma bicarb of 15 to 20, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and anemia. So AKI you'll often see in a hospitalized patient where you'll see they're uh, because they became dehydrated or they have heart, congestive heart failure, and you'll see a steady rise in their creatinine. Treatment. So you determine the cause and correct it and treat the patient for hyperkalemia and pulmonary edema. So the most obvious thing, stop any nephrotoxic drugs. There's always a complete list that can be found online or in some textbooks. Dialysis as needed, and that often requires a renal consult. Usually you dialyze for issues that cannot be corrected uh, through medications. Consider phosphate binders. The biggest thing is it's always best to prevent the AKI. So prevention of AKI is more important than, uh, and, and is becoming more and more recognized and uh, it's considered standard of care to now to prophylax against AKI. So you want to properly maintain fluid balance and blood volume and BP in patients, avoid or limit uh, or by minimize the use of contrast agents and pre-treating with normal saline before the test. Those are very uh, important preventions. Conclusions. So AKI is a common uh, problem, and the most common form of AKI is pre-renal. It accounts for 50 to 80 percent. The second most common is the uh, intrinsic kidney disease, which is 10 to 40 percent, and lastly, uh, post-renal, which is 5 to 10 percent. A lot of AKI is preventable, so it's very important to uh, actively about AKI when treating a patient and to look for ways to minimize its occurrence. So this concludes our introduction to AKI. Thank you for coming to Physician Academy. Please share our talk with others. Encourage others to join. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to your, our YouTube page. Thank you.